Part 2, Chapter 5 Specific Suggestions for Simple Sabotage It will not be possible to evaluate the desirability of simple sabotage in every area without having in mind specifically what individual acts and results are embraced by the definition of simple sabotage. Therefore, a listing of specific acts follows classified according to the types of target. This list is presented as an example rather than an exhaustive outline. As new techniques are developed or new fields explored, it should be elaborated and expanded. For this reason, feedback from those activities in the field is encouraged, as this information should be evaluated and included in future updates of this field manual. Special note on explosives. With some exceptions, explosives are discouraged as a tool for the simple saboteur for several reasons. First being the inherent danger of explosives to the saboteur. Second being the difficulty in preventing the innocent from being harmed. Third being the exaggerated response authorities exhibit when explosives are involved. Part 2 Chapter 5-1 Buildings Government offices, court and municipal buildings, police stations, jails, county-slash-parish utility maintenance buildings, and even corporate buildings of the military-industrial complex or the prison-industrial complex, along with obvious targets in the U.S. like the NSA, FBI, BATF, DOJ, INS, IRS, DEA, DHS, TSA, FAA, etc., or their equivalent agencies and other governments are outstanding targets for simple sabotage. They are extremely susceptible to damage, as will be listed below, and they offer some of the best opportunities to such friend saboteurs as janitors, cleaning crews, and casual visitors. And when damaged, they present a relatively large handicap to our enemy, both psychologically and actual. Part 2 Chapter 5-1.1 Fire the use of fire is a point of controversy, but most will agree that if fire is to be used as a tool of simple sabotage, it must be used selectively and with great care to avoid injuring the innocent or damaging private property. That said, fires can be started wherever there is an accumulation of inflammable material. Warehouses are obviously promising targets, as are fuel storage areas, but incendiary storage need not to be confined to them alone. Whenever possible, arrange to have the fire start after you have left the area. Use a tea light and paper combination, setting it as close as possible to the inflammable material you want to burn. Remove the tea light from its metal base, as it has one, leaving only the small candle. You may need to trim the edges of the candle to make it as small as is practical. This will leave as little residue as possible for inspectors to find after the fire. From a sheet of paper. Tear a strip one or two inches wide and wrap it around the base of the candle two or three times. Twist more sheets of paper into loose ropes and place them around the base of the candle. When the candle frame reaches the encircled strip, it will be ignited and in turn will ignite the surrounding paper. The size, heat, and duration of the resulting flame will depend on how much paper you use. Additionally, you may need to use a small amount of Vaseline or other petroleum jelly on the strips of paper to help them ignite. Experiment with this process until you are comfortable and can repeat the results with each attempt before you use it for simple sabotage. With a flame of this kind, do not attempt to ignite anything but easily inflammable materials. To light more resistant materials, one could use such a candle as above plus tightly rolling a twisted paper which has been rubbed in more petroleum jelly. To create a briefer but even hotter flame, Infuse dryer lint with petroleum jelly and form it into a nest of plain or saturated paper which is to be fired by the candle. Again, experimentation is the key to success. To make another type of simple fuse, rub one end of a piece of cotton string with petroleum jelly. Rub a pinch of gunpowder over the inch of string where greasy string meets clean string. Then ignite the clean end of the string. It will burn slowly into a flame, in much the same way that a cigarette burns, until it reaches the grease and gunpowder. It will then flare up suddenly. The grease-treated string will then burn with a flame. The same effect may be achieved by using matches instead of the grease and gunpowder. 
Run the string over the match heads, taking care that the string is not pressed or knotted. This too will produce a sudden flame. The advantage of this type of fuse is that string burns at a set speed. You can time your fire by the length and thickness of the string you choose. Use a fuse such as the one suggested above to start a fire in an office after hours. The destruction of paper records and other types of documents can be a burden to the enemy. However, fire may not destroy data on computers, so the impact may be more psychological than strategic. Once again, the selection of the target is key to achieving the maximum impact of the simple sabotage. Fire may be more useful as harassment or as a distraction than whatever it may accomplish on its own. In basements where waste material is kept, janitors should accumulate oily and greasy waste. Such waste sometimes ignites spontaneously, but can easily be lit with a cigarette or match. If you are a janitor on night duty, you can be the first to report the fire. But, don't report it too soon. Also, a clean factory is not as susceptible to fire as a dirty one. Workers should be careless with refuse, and janitors should be inefficient in cleaning and in handling flammable cleaning products. If enough debris and trash can be accumulated, an otherwise fireproof building will become inflammable. Once again, fire can be timed with other events to draw authorities away from a more important activity. Part 2 Chapter 5-1.2 Water, Sewers, and Miscellaneous Fire suppression or fire sprinkler systems may seem like the perfect way to commit simple sabotage. However, automatic sprinkler systems vary in type, function, and design. Some types can be activated by simple means. Others are complicated. Some systems spray water from all the sprinklers at once. Others only activate one sprinkler at a time, or one zone at a time. Some don't even use water. Some automatically contact the fire department, some don't. Some sound an audible alarm, and some don't. Before you assume you can use a fire sprinkler system for sabotage, find out the type of system used and make sure it will do what you expect it to do. Research is key. Do your homework before you commit to a project. Toilets and sewer systems are always vulnerable to a variety of simple sabotage, and unlike fire, they are not likely to get out of control and cause unwanted damage or injuries. Every public building has toilet facilities, and very little is done to protect them. Also, it's reasonably safe to assume that restrooms are camera-free zones. One plugged toilet won't close a building, but can be a source of irritation and frustration. However, if the entire sewer system of building can be disrupted, the building will need to be closed until the problem is resolved. A simple plug can be made with a large natural sponge. Moisten the sponge and squeeze it tightly into a ball. Wrap it with string and let it dry. Remove the string when fully dried. The sponge will be in a form of a tight, hard ball. Drop it in a toilet and quickly flush it down. The sponge will gradually expand to its normal size and plug the sewage line. Some experimentation may be needed to get the right size sponge, but keep trying until you are successful. Expanding foam sold in hardware stores and aerosol cans under the brand name Great Stuff can be used for more extensive sewer obstructions. Fill a small sandwich bag with foam and quickly flush it down the toilet. The foam will expand and escape the bag, plugging the sewer line. Be careful as the foam tends to stick to everything and won't wash off of hands and clothing. It may be possible to attach a longer tube to the nozzle of the can of foam and fish it down the toilet, 3 feet by 6 feet or 1 or 2 meters. Then discharge the foam directly into the sewer line. Such an action would take some planning and may involve leaving behind evidence. So always take that into consideration when planning any action of simple sabotage, especially those that involve D&D. &D. Oftentimes, outside of a building or in a basement or service area of the building, there are sewer line clean-out access caps that can be easily opened and foam can be injected directly into the building's sewer service line. Cans of expanding foam are difficult to conceal, but can be used in an unended list of applications for clogging or gumming up the mechanical works of office machines, elevators, heating slash AC systems, and even security cameras. Quick shots of foam into computer case fans can slowly overheat computers. Expanding foam and injectable glues may be the perfect tools for the friend saboteur, 
as their applications are only limited by the imagination of the anarchist. Door locks and hinges are a weak point in the security of any building, but they can also be a source of irritation when they don't work correctly. Hardware and audio parts stores sell a product called Loctite Thread Locker Red 271. This is an amazing product that comes in an easily concealable tube. With a quick squeeze, this product can be injected directly into locks or anywhere a key would fit. It quickly renders the lock useless. Hardware stores also sell a two-part adhesive in a syringe called epoxy. As you actuate the syringe, the two parts mix into a hard, powerful adhesive. Sometimes a toothpick or some other item must be used to stir the mixture for maximum hardening effect. You can use a syringe to inject the epoxy into the hinges of doors that are not in the viewing field of security cameras. This method can be used on older automobiles and trucks with manual door locks. It can also be used on windshield wiper arms and other locations. Your greatest weapon is always your imagination, so set it free to discover what mayhem you can bring upon our enemy. In addition to all of the above, late night building maintenance workers can carefully switch signs and mislabel halls, floors, and rooms, mislabel electrical panels and electrical switches, or anything else that will cause low level confusion. Mislabel exits and entrances in parking garages, move designated parking spaces to different locations, intentionally paint parking lines too close to each other, causing cars to be crammed together, remove or alter overhead height slash clearance warnings in parking garages. Building cleaning crews can randomly remove papers and reports from desks and unlock drawers at night, or simply move items from one drawer to another, or even from one cubicle to another. Perhaps, make it look like one cubicle worker is stealing his co-worker's items. Be selective with your targets and focus on the most productive state supporters and decision makers. If you find it necessary to force entrance into a building, a window or door is usually assumed to be the best way to break in. However, that may not be the case. Windows and doors are usually primary locations for security devices, cameras, and alarms. Interestingly enough, often the weakest point in a building is a ground level wall, preferably behind bushes or other landscaping. Many exterior walls are simple wooden frames or studs set 16 inches to 24 inches apart with thin chicken wire and paper covered over with stucco. An inexpensive stud finder will tell you where to avoid. Using any of several small hand tools, the stucco between the studs can be quickly and quietly compromised with light tapping and some prying until the paper and wire can be cut away with pliers. The interior of these walls are often simple sheetrock that will also quickly and quietly break away with light tapping and prying. Part 2, Chapter 5-2 Travel and Transportation Part 2, Chapter 5, Slash 2.1 Railways and Airports Make travel as inconvenient as possible for government supporters, media types, and military-industrial complex management. Make mistakes in issuing tickets, leaving portions of the journey unconnected. If a government agent is trying to make a tight connection, create as many delays as possible. Overbook flights, cancel connections, then, when the problems surface, slowly handwrite customer complaints. Ask an endless stream of questions. Constantly apologize while doing nothing to solve the issue. Prolong every process until the train slash plane is nearly ready to leave or has left. Delete reservations. Double charge those who are not paying attention. Intentionally send them to the wrong airport or the wrong gate. Obtain access to the arrival slash departure boards and randomly program small mistakes into the displays. See that the luggage of government supporters is mishandled or unloaded at the wrong locations. Switch address labels on baggage. Add confusing, suspicious, or embarrassing items into the luggage of government supporters. Be imaginative and have fun at the expense of those who seek to be our masters. Flyers for massage services, oversized adult toys, inappropriate pornography, receipts from strip clubs, or explicit love letters strategically placed in just the right baggage can be priceless to our cause. Always remember, these enemies of humanity would do far worse to you if they had half a chance. So show them no mercy. Part 2, Chapter 5-2.2 Automotive and Roads 
Special tip. Slicing a tire can be a quick down and dirty strike against authority. A nastier act is to use a razor knife set to a very shallow depth. Not enough to go all the way through the sidewall of the tire. Just enough to weaken it. Use an old tire to practice getting the depth right. Reach into the interior side of the tire and make your slice from the metal wheel outward toward the tread. Your cut will not be visible, will not immediately cause a flat, and will likely blow when the vehicle is in motion. Because of the shape of the blowout, it will likely appear as a manufacturer defect or road damage. For more fun, reprogram lighted signs to display nonsensical messages or false information. In areas where traffic is heavily composed of government autos, trucks, and convoys of various kinds, remove or change signs at intersections and on and off ramps of freeways. Remove or alter clearance signs on bridges and overpasses with low overhead clearance. Remove or alter weight limit signs on weak bridges. The removal of dead end or no outlet signs can be very important before riots and demonstrations start as it becomes possible to bait heavy police slash military vehicles into a situation where they can neither turn around nor escape. Always remember that locals know their streets and ignore signs. However, in emergencies, authorities move support from other areas and those outsiders rely upon signage. In Egypt, rioters baited armed vehicles down narrow alleys, then blocked the vehicles in with rubble, tractors, and construction equipment. Then they threw Molotov cocktails, forcing the police to exit their vehicles and run away on foot. More special tips. In spite of popular labeling of police vehicles as tanks or bearcats, the correct terminology is MRAP or Mine Resistant Ambush Protected. In actual terms, that means nothing to us because we shouldn't be attempting to use mines, IEDs, or any other explosive device against police. But we should understand the inherent weaknesses of these vehicles. They are extremely heavy, roughly 36,000 pounds, which is almost magical for us when mud is involved. They have limited visibility and are difficult to maneuver on tight city streets and alleyways. A well-placed Molotov cocktail at the base of the windshield will blind the driver. Some MRAPs have advanced optics. However, many of these can be disrupted with fire since they are heat sensitive. Also, Molotov cocktails aimed at the running boards are far more effective than those aimed at the roof. On the topic of Molotov cocktails, remember you are dealing with a tool that can quickly turn ugly. Before building, supplying, or using such a tool, ask yourself if you are willing to burn a man to death. Are you willing to cook a man alive? If not, consider the alternative. A glue slash glitter bomb may be able to disable the end wrap without the danger of killing the occupants or accidentally setting yourself on fire. The glitter bomb can be as easy to make as a Molotov cocktail while accomplishing the same task and far more humorous in execution. A simple balloon filled with a mixture of 50% Elmer's glue and 50% large glitter, carefully aimed at an MRAP windshield, may have the same effect as a Molotov cocktail, that being the forced abandonment of the protection of the vehicle. However, rather than burning the cop, we cover him with fabulous glitter, much to the envy of stylish cockroaches everywhere. After all, why kill when you can humiliate? If you can initiate damage to a heavily traveled road, passing traffic and the elements will do the rest. If you have access to heavy equipment, use it to cut small ruts in asphalt roads. Passing trucks will accentuate the ruts to a point where substantial repair will be needed. Newly paved highways can be easily damaged with a simple pickaxe. A few strikes in the new soft asphalt is all it takes to begin the process of destruction. This kind of sabotage is very important near capital cities, supporting the fact that governments are incapable of maintaining roads even for their own capitals. Once again, these activities should be done secretly, so that when the state supporters accuse us of sabotage, the above-ground activists can accuse them of being paranoid conspiracy nuts. Quote, As if anarchists have nothing better to do than go around digging potholes in the middle of the night. Come on, what next? Bigfoot masterminded 9-11? Crop circles are aliens sending anarchists coded signals? Unquote. This is the game they play with us. Why not reverse it on them? Taxi drivers can waste the enemy's time by driving slow. 
intentionally driving into congested areas, or by taking the longest possible route to the destination. When called for a pickup, take as long as possible to arrive. Create delays, make excuses, and pretend not to speak the language. Anything to delay and agitate the government supporter. Part 2, Chapter 5-2.3 Lodging, Hotels, and Motels Front desk staff, food services, housekeeping, and building maintenance infiltration are extremely important in this section of business. Travelers are at the peak of their vulnerability and typically have a high level of trust in the professionals in this industry. Friend saboteurs who obtain positions in the hospitality industry should do all they can do to keep their jobs and not be found out. The list of simple sabotages available in the hospitality industry is only as limited as the individual imagination. Many of the same baggage handling sabotage suggested above under quote, 5-2.1 railways and airports unquote, can be used here. 1. Two taxis are loaded baggage at the same time. One guest is catching a flight at the airport. The other is headed into a city for an extended business day. And somehow the luggage gets blended. 2. The good reverend and his wife are in town to head up to the congressional prayer breakfast, and somehow a list of escort services appear in the bag, along with the receipt dated for the last time the reverend visited the city without his wife. It has lipstick stains on the words. Quote, Who's my favorite naughty sinner? Ask for Mercedes when you come back, baby. Unquote. 3. The four-star general is in town to make an appearance on national television to answer questions about drone strikes on civilians in foreign cities, and somehow three drops of phenolphthalein make it into his breakfast. A few hours later, he rushes off camera and almost makes it to the men's room before he publicly soils himself. Oh, how embarrassing. Hopefully, no one happened to be standing around with their cell phone in hand catching that for posterity. Side note of caution. Phenolphthalein is very strong and will absorb through intact skin. Unless you want a case of screaming diarrhea, use caution when handling it. Perhaps consider rubber gloves? Part 2, Chapter 5-3 Targeting Humans Of all forms of simple sabotage, targeting humans may possibly turn out to be the most controversial practice. Definitely the most dangerous clearly requires the highest level of skill, and when done correctly, is likely to be the most productive to our cause. Part 2, Chapter 5-3.1 The Media The media have been the primary propaganda tool of the state. One can imagine 5,000 years ago, a talented storyteller garnering the king's favors by weaving a tale about how the king's mother may have been enticed and wooed by a tricky deity. And that's why the king is so great. He is actually a half-god. Looking back 1,000 years ago, what a catchy tune that troubadour is singing about the merciful king that forgives a criminal every year at the great feast he throws the poor. Then, as now, governments steal the wealth of productive people and use it to brainwash those same productive people into loving the government that robs them. In the current manifestation of the state, news and entertainment are so intertwined that sometimes one wonders if it is even possible for the news media to fabricating a story so blatantly absurd that the general public would question its validity. And when a wildly inaccurate portrayal of news events is accepted as fact, often the entertainment industry steps up with a major motion picture retelling the same lie, thereby reselling it to the gullible masses, including the ones who don't pay any attention to the news media in the first place. This presents a problem for those of us dedicated to the truth and committed to revealing that truth to as many people as possible. Our competition, the state puppets in the media slash entertainment industry, are extremely well-funded and well-motivated. Like the kings, jesters, minstrels, and bards of old, they enjoy their spot near the royal banquet table and are always a part of the royal ball. Trust in the media must be broken for us to succeed. The entire media con and all of its propaganda are like every other con job. 
it stands or falls on the rock of trust. The phrase con job is short for confidence job, because the only way a con job can work is if you take advantage of the confidence of the mark or victim. The moment the mark loses confidence in the con man, the con man loses the con. It therefore follows that if we are to beat the state's media puppets, we must break the public's confidence in their vision of current events and history. On the surface, that would seem like an easy task. The media typically employ simple-minded clowns who only seem to be talented in chattering a continual stream of nonsense fed to them in their earpiece. But in fact, it is far more difficult than it seems. You see, the relationship between the con man and the mark is not as simple as one might think. The mark wants to believe the con. Similarly, the public wants desperately to believe the media slash entertainment industry. Deep down inside, the public knows that if they question the media, and if the media is found to be lying, then they, the public, will be forced to do something. And the public hates it when they have to do something. Especially if by do something, we mean research the truth, weigh facts, learn new things, and then act on that newly found information. It's easier to just trust the guy with the perfect hair and gleaming smile that they watch every night on the magical talking box. The key in defeating the media is the same key that must be used against the state on every field of conflict. That being, to fight the enemy according to our strength and his weakness. To do this, we must examine the strengths of the mainstream media entertainment complex and discover its weaknesses. We must avoid the temptation to fight the media on its choice of battlefield. And we must lure the media to our choice of battlefield. In practical terms, as incredibly silly as it would be to invite the U.S. military to an open battle, or as stupid as it would be to attempt something like an armed march on Washington, D.C., it is just as foolish to directly take on the mainstream media by pouring money into our own media outlet designed to directly compete with NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, BBC, etc., based around some dynamic personality or team of talented on-screen personalities. Liberty-minded people who choose these kinds of foolish ventures should not be trusted in decision-making since they clearly don't have the first bit of wisdom, nor do they understand how competition in the state-controlled market works. These ventures are tantamount to a person who plays online sword fight games, taking on an actual sword master in a real fight with real swords. The mainstream media rely on the big production, the studio with the perfect lighting and the host with the perfect elocution the seemingly informed experts on every imaginable topic, and the cutaway to the 2 minute 30 second video clip reinforcing what the talking head just explained. This is not our battleground, and these cannot be our weapons. On this battlefront, the above ground activists can win the field, not by standing toe to toe with giants, but by an unending barrage of spitballs fired by a million cynical straws poking out from behind every leaf. The above-ground activists must do what they do best. Mock authority, photobomb the man on the street interview, laugh at the experts, pick every newscast apart a thousand times on websites. In short, disrespect the mainstream media in every peaceful way possible. Use humor and parody to show the absurdity of the mainstream media. Use inexpensive podcasts, cell phone footage, and live streaming content of actual events. Debunk the media and have fun doing it. Then, dear activists, leave the dangerous part to us, the underground. Part 2, Chapter 5-3.1.01 Deceive the Deceivers Recent history provides us with a hint of a massive inherent weakness of the mainstream media. Adnan Haj, a Lebanese freelance photographer, worked for Reuters for over 10 years, supplying the news giant with at least 920 photos. In 2006, many of these obviously fake and altered photos were publicly exposed as such. It still took Reuters two years to purge them from its collection. Looking back on these old photos, it's amazing how bad the Photoshop work looks. And yet the media and the public believe them when they fit the narrative that Reuters was publishing. On the topic of fitting the narrative, that brings us to the infamous Islamic rage boy, Shaquille Ahmad Bhatt. Even if his name doesn't sound familiar, you will almost certainly know his face if you were to see him. He's been used all over the mainstream media and in alternative media 
as the poster boy of Islamic hate, and yet his personal story doesn't even begin to match the internet and media persona. But truth doesn't matter in an industry that sells lies. This is why the same old Palestinian woman crying, pulling out her clothing, and sometimes pictured with a dead child, appears over and over again in the media, spanning ten years and portrayed in locations a thousand miles apart. Because she is an actor and the news is fake. Still not convinced that the mainstream media and its followers are gullible and given to overreach? Consider the 2007 Boston Moonanite panic. Such a stunt repeated in a different city every six months will both stimulate more rebellion to authority and drive the authoritarian stuff shirts out of their tiny minds. In the case of the Boston Moonanite panic, almost everyone between the ages 10 and 30 got the joke at the time, while almost everyone in government was aghast at this act of terrorism. It's one thing to expose the mainstream media lies or play up to their ignorance and fear. It's another thing to feed them lies intentionally to discredit them. Greed, prejudice, ignorance, and lust for attention drive the media. Their hunger for the outlandish causes them to accept any crazy lie so long as it serves their narrative. So we should feed them as much as they will swallow, then step back and let their friends, the above-ground activists, expose their mistakes. The two-pronged attack. We feed them fake news, and our friends mock them for publishing it. Would you care for some more down-and-dirty examples? Learn the lesson of the Carlos hoax from 1988, when a small, lightly funded troop of merry hoaxers demonstrated for the world to see that the mainstream media were stupid, desperate, and gullible. Now feed them fake news, fake pictures, fake reports, fake tips to the local and national media, as these are only the beginning. Disinformation during tragedies will humiliate the media. Fake scandals on politicians, fake witnesses, Hoax after hoax in a never-ending barrage for as long as they will buy what we are selling. Friend saboteurs should take acting classes and practice fooling the media. We can be crisis actors for freedom, getting on camera, spinning incredible tales punctuated with a flood of tears. Spin local and national media as the buffoons and shrills of government that they are. Make throwies and mimic the Moonanite panic. A throwy consists of a button battery a diffused LED and a magnet taped together. Be creative. Tie mylar balloons together, covered in LEDs, and release them as a fake UFO. Then call the media with UFO eyewitness reports. Shark Week may be over, but what about all the camel spiders that are invading the Southwest? The opportunities are only limited by the imagination of the individual. The media constantly falls for the fake drug cases that pop up from time to time. So feed them more of the same. So the, quote, choking game, unquote, was a hoax. But what about all those kids getting high from ketchup LSD, made from fermented ketchup and regular button mushrooms? Fake, not a real thing. Imagine the impact of a, quote, unquote, news crew that interviews a local police spokesman about the success of a local school D.A.R.E. program, but unexpectedly asks the cop about local kids taking the ketchup LSD. Quote, does your police office keep track of the children who have been admitted to the local hospital due to the ketchup LSD fad? Unquote. Quote, Do you dare officers warn the children about the deadly ketchup LSD? Unquote. Now, sit back and watch the pig squirm on camera. How about a call-in campaign to the local media about the growing problem in local hospitals with the ketchup LSD fad? How many beds are occupied by these victims? In northern climates... News media may be vulnerable to fake school snow closure reports. What? An avalanche has engulfed a local quickie mart? Oh no. Apu Nahasapima Petala is dead. Shall I go on? Do I really need to go on? You are only limited by your own mind. Part 2, Chapter 5 3.2 Psychological Operations all successful warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When most active, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy feel safely out of our reach. When far away, we must haunt the dreams and the shadows of our enemy's mind and appear to be around every corner. 
Part 2, Chapter 5-3.2.1 Gaslighting Targeting Psychops as Simple Sabotage When several friend saboteurs are working in the same location, be they co-workers, building maintenance, cleaning crews, and janitorial staff, or any combination, you can work in harmony to disrupt the productivity of a target. Single out a specific target from your gaslight operations. Use discretion in choosing your target. Look for someone who is actively involved in state aggression, a person highly productive in their field, but displaying signs of emotional stress, overwork, alcohol slash drug issues, relationship issues, etc. Take your time, observe his habits, and look for weak points in his day-to-day -day routines. Perhaps your target can become unstable by something as simple as moving his most used items from one place to another on a repetitive basis. Move his coat or sweater to the opposite side of his office or cubicle. When he steps away from a cup of coffee or a restroom break, move his chair into his closet. On a different day, remove one wheel from his computer desk chair and place it in his coat pocket. If he keeps his window blinds open, close them. Unplug his computer monitor while leaving everything else alone. Once your target has begun to show signs of self-doubt, you can step up your operation. If you have ongoing direct visual with the target, it may be possible to place very small wireless speakers in two or three locations in his work area. Control each speaker separately with your phone. Have five or six separate recordings of strangers saying his name. Alternate playing them, changing from one speaker to the next. This process may seem cruel and heartless, but if your target's work directly facilitates the robbery, incarceration, torture, or death of the innocent, then he has brought this on his own head when he enters such a field of endeavor. He should not be the recipient of our mercy if he makes his living from the suffering of the innocent. Part 2, Chapter 5-3.2.2 Hit them where they live. Let's say you have developed a friend saboteur network of five active friends all in the same general area. Let's say all of you have some outdoor yard or garden tools, mowers, a wheelbarrow, a leaf blower, a small utility trailer, or a pickup truck. Or even better, one of your group owns a lawn service company. Let's say you have a target that is a subject of an active gaslight operation in a nearby town. Let's say you do a little inventive printing and place fake company identifications on your truck. And while the gaslight subject's home is empty and everyone is at work or school, your crew of fake yard service workers remove or destroy the landscaping of his fine upscale home. Then send him a fictitious bill for the work. Then begin spoof calling him from a fake bill collector. Let's change that scenario slightly. Let's say none of your network of friends saboteurs is talented in the ways of yard work. However, one of your group owns an automotive towing or wrecking truck. Change the identification of your truck, and when the subject goes to a store or other location where they will be away from the car for a few minutes, tow the subject's car to a non-parking area a few miles away and dump it there. You say, quote, But none of my network of friends has a yard business or a tow truck. Unquote. Well, that's the beauty of a distributed network with no central planner. Ask your friends what they have, what they can do, and make up your own plan. Part 2, Chapter 5-4 Identities The Department of Homeland Security has revealed that during the 31 months from October 2012 through April 2015, more than 13,000 badges and credentials 165 firearms, and 589 DHS cell phones were lost or stolen. Having multiple identities is generally illegal. Using such identities in the commission of a crime multiplies the punishment that governments hand out to those who are caught and convicted. Skilled teams working with false identities can and have walked into prisons and walked out with prisoners. Having false identities can be a source of income for a subversive movement Identities listed with the U.S. Social Security Administration as being permanently disabled may receive monthly payments from the government of $1,000 or more. Simple mathematics and logic tell us that the U.S. government hands out a lot of money to a lot of accounts, 
and all those can't possibly be legitimate. One more note of caution in regards to identities. Do not simply jump on the dark net and grab the first fake identity someone is selling. It's far better for a member of the underground to develop the skill to produce false identities than to rely on a supplier of questionable motive. Part 2, Chapter 5-4.1 The practice of hacking is intentionally not covered in this manual for a number of reasons. However, the small word of encouragement is added for hackers and would-be hackers. Two types of hacking that require very little to no computer skills are often referred to as social hacking and visual hacking. Some would place visual hacking as a subset of social hacking. Social hacking can include such things as the practice of getting people to let you in where you're not supposed to be, or to give you information they shouldn't. This is often done over the phone, but the skilled can do it in person. Visual hacking can include grabbing sensitive documents from an office printer or an attended desk, watching someone log into an account and remember their login info, or searching through a trash for private documents or personal information. The more a person practices social hacking, the better he gets, and eventually it becomes second nature to constantly be on the alert for opportunities to use your skills. It shouldn't be necessary to explain how handy it is to have sensitive or personal information or access to private or secured locations. So we will simply add this. Even if you don't know what to do with the information, someone in the friend's network wants that information. Someone can use it. Part 2, Chapter 5-5 Forbidden Plants and Booze as Simple Sabotage a wise man once said, quote, It is in war that the state really comes into its own. Swelling in power, in number, in pride, in absolute dominion over the economy and the society. End quote. This is a true statement. However, it is in the trinity of prohibition, regulation, and taxation that the state owns the productivity of the individual, therefore facilitates war. When the state marries war with prohibition, regulation, and taxation, then we see the beast stand to its full height. The quote-unquote war on drugs has been a ruse from the start, and only the simple-minded or the intentionally fooled ever believed it otherwise. It is an excuse to militarize a local police while using basic economics to create a boogeyman. Drug gangs, cartels, minorities for the purpose of scaring and controlling the ignorant masses. The war on drugs provides the backdrop for rampant racism, as the prohibition is unequally prosecuted. At the same time, it's a method for funneling unimaginable amounts of undocumented cash into the pockets of select operatives in the intelligence community. In addition to all the above, the alcohol industry and the incredibly powerful pharmaceutical industry complex have long been supporters of drug prohibition. When the time comes, governments will back down and allow more and more legal recreational drug usage. The move to quote, unquote, legalize it and tax it and quote, unquote, legalize medical marijuana are nothing more than a continuation of the same rules, using pacification techniques to control public resistance. Eventually, marijuana will become more and more mainstream and will be corporately controlled like the alcohol industry. Only a small handful of crony corporations will be allowed to grow it, transport it, or sell it. The price will be fixed by regulation, and taxation will be built into the price structure on multiple levels. That will not be a victory for freedom. It will be a successful act of pacification and neutering. Before then, during this window of opportunity, the drug war can provide several methods of simple sabotage. Farmers, gardeners, and horticulturists can do a great service for the cause by hybridizing a strain of marijuana so that it reproduces faster and grows shorter in height. Activists can spread this weed on quote-unquote public land. Wooded areas of city parks, highway medians, fence rows, or anywhere that doesn't get mowed very often would be a great place to throw seed bombs. Imagine if marijuana grew rapidly and spread like dandelions. Now imagine trying to regulate or tax dandelions. If it's in great enough abundance and crony corporations won't be able to monopolize it, and governments won't be able to eradicate it, 
but they will try. They will throw money in crazy proportions in a fight like this. Much the same argument can be made for Papaverus somniferum, the opium poppy. This plant would be a beautiful addition to any flower garden, and few people would have any idea of its purpose. Imagine if some industrious gardener were to start heavily producing seeds for seed bombs. Much of California and the western mountain states have a very similar climate to Afghanistan and Turkey, where it grows and viciously sells seeds. The gardener that did this service to our cause would be a true saboteur. Hooch moonshine, white lightning, white liquor, or any other name you want to use, can be safely produced on a countertop with a device not much bigger than a coffee maker, for a fraction of the cost of corporate alcohol. Current to the writing of this manual, a countertop device like described above is sold by several independent manufacturers on the internet for about $200 and can consistently produce a safe, decent quality vodka for about $5 per gallon. Now tell me about growing your tomato garden for agorism. Why is any anarchist buying government liquor? Like Bitcoin, agorism in the production of forbidden or restricted products like these undermines the authority of the state, creates funding for more projects, and stimulates the black market economy. So what are you waiting for? Super glue that cop's wiper blades, glitter bomb that mayor, and let's all throw our shoes into the gears of this machine until it grinds to a halt. More ideas? Okay. How about these for future chapters? Baiting politicians, judges, and police chiefs into honey traps for extortion, profit, and fun. Developing a transportation network to move activists and dissidents away from government reach and into safer areas. Use of drop phones, use of voice over internet protocol, use of virtual private network, use of the onion router. Do you like these ideas? Great. Write the chapters and add them to this book. To the first Lego Brigade, friends, be safe, have fun, do your best, and be proud of what you do.